Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we're back here in the spaceship to do some macro. Um, so a couple updates. Uh, I posted a, this case study just earlier this morning, not too long ago, uh, on the website. It's under assignments or problem sets or whatever, uh, number three. And uh, so you can, I would encourage you to check that out. So let me, um, probably not a bad idea to do that now, to just kind of go through things so that we're all clear on, on uh, how this is gonna work. So uh, I'm gonna say two weeks um, time frame to, to complete it. And uh, the submission method uh, will be Blackboard this time. So I'm gonna create uh, a formal assignment on Blackboard and then you can just upload uh, a PDF or a doc or an ODF, open document, you know, anything within reason uh, that, that can be read by most people um, uh, of your, your kind of your case study for your particular country, okay? Uh, I haven't created the official Blackboard thing, but it'll just be a, a placeholder because Think about the, the website is holding the main um, kind of document for the, the assignment. I'll, I'll put up like a PDF on Blackboard because it requires you to, but, but you can, I would encourage you to use the, uh, the website version if you can. Um, but they should be the same. So uh, yeah, so two weeks, so Monday, April 13th, Blackboard. Um, I don't know, I'll do like at the end of the day. So like, you know, 11.59 PM on Monday. So until the end of the day. Uh, to, you'll have to get it there. Um, so the basic idea, though, is make sure that I can see the chat here. So the basic idea is um, where we're going to choose a country, like where each individually we're going to choose our own country uh, that we think is interesting. That's that's kind of you know you're curious about looking into. Okay, uh, it could be a country that you already know a lot about, uh, or it could be a country that you know nothing about. You just want to find out. Um, not the U.S. just because we study the U.S. all the time, and um, we should we should broaden our horizons a bit. Um, you can do Canada if you want. I don't know, uh, but yeah, you can do any literally anything but the U.S. That's the only constraint. The, well, the only the other constraint is that there should actually be data on the country. So, if you look at the, the data sources that we're going to be using, I would give those a quick skim just to make sure that your country of interest is represented as well. Okay, so. We got pretty good coverage on these things. I think like 150 at least countries, but there's a, you know there's a lot. There's 200 it changes all the time, but there's 200 around 200 countries I think um, in the world. So just make sure that your country is represented in the data. Okay, um, so that's the idea. First, choose your country, and then do the analysis. Everything after that should be pretty similar. Okay, so um, and then in terms of how we're gonna how I want you to go about this. Essentially, so you're going to be using a lot of the growth uh, accounting and, and decomposition tools that we talked about in class. Okay, um, you're also you're going to be working with data. You know, we're going to be looking at real actual data here, um, and so you, know, you should, you know, probably a lot of you are going to use Excel. I would imagine. Um, I think most people are, are like you know proficient in basic Excel stuff. I mean, we're just going to be taking like columns of stuff and then computing like that thing times some factor or raises some power. Okay, so you're gonna to need to know a little bit of those math functions in Excel, but I think you can you can handle that. Um, if you if you wanna use or are, are comfortably using stuff like Stata or R or Python, you can go for it. Um, that, that, that's cool, uh, but you don't have to. So you can, you can, you can always use Excel, okay? Um, so yeah, so we're gonna be doing some data work and then kind of the output will be graphs, mostly graphs and, and descriptions. So you can think about, you know, I'm calling it a case study. You can think about it as like a report on this country with particular uh, framework that I'm going to give you. Okay. So um, not, I guess I'm not going to be super specific on length. I mean, you, a lot of the output is graphs. So that's pretty much, you know, that's like a graph. That's, that's a unit of analysis there. Um, and then some of its description. And, and so for the description, I mean, just you know, a paragraph or a few paragraphs is, is fine. It doesn't have to be a fully fledged paper or anything like that. Okay, so um, yeah, so so do that in terms of data sources. Okay, that we're going to be using. So the both the two main sources that we're going to be using are one is Pen World Tables, which is a cross country, you know, fairly comprehensive uh, uh, panel like uh, of data over time uh, for a bunch of different countries. So that's that's going to be your 
primary source, especially for the first part. Um, and that's on the website. That's linked at the bottom of the website and data sources. And then the other thing is the, the Jones beyond GDP data. So there, that's sort of like they tabulated all that stuff. Some of it is from taken from the Penworld tables and, and in that other spreadsheet. Some of it's from like World Bank, stuff on inequality, um, and then it's sort of like tabulated and, and stuff like that. So, so they do a lot of the work for you, honestly, and you, you're kind of like looking in there and uh, seeing what's up for your particular country. Okay, so those that also that Jones Beyond GDP is there's an Excel spreadsheet with that linked on the website as well. Okay, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then in terms of what we're actually going to be doing, there's basically three parts. First part is growth analysis. Okay. So here, I'm just gonna ask you, okay, do this growth decomposition. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the, you need to do a little bit of derivation here. So I'm gonna give you the production function. I want you to tell me like, okay, oops, that's a auto translate. So I want you to tell me, um, you know, in terms of growth rates. So take the growth rate of this equation, you know, the growth rate of Y is the growth rate of Z plus alpha times the growth rate of K plus one minus alpha times the growth rate of L. So turn it into a growth rate equation and then calculate those growth rates in the data and show me, you know, okay, here's how the total output is growing. Here's how, you know, capital levels are growing and you're gonna have to look into pen world tables and figure out what is the appropriate number for capital, okay? I'm happy to give you pointers there as you get in more into the data um, and then the, the population, okay? Uh, and then plot those growth rates, okay? So that's one um, thing you wanna, and you wanna be careful about that. And she, I just wanna give you a decomposition of what how much each factor is contributing to growth. And I want you to give me that over time. So it should be like for part A, for this main growth decomposition, it should be a plot with the growth rates of like output, population, capital, and productivity. You know, four different lines and showing me, or at least three, those three constituent parts, showing me uh, how each of those are moving over time from year to year. Okay, so not just like beginning and end, but like, you know, every single year or maybe like grouped into like five year periods if you want. So showing you how that changes over time. Okay, so that that's that's going to be kind of a what a lot of these questions are going to look like variations on that. Okay, so part B, for instance, is do that, but then also add in human capital. Okay, so now human capital is going to give you more information. Okay, and that information is going to be correlated with other stuff like investment in capital, regular capital, and productivity. And so it's it's going to change. Not it's not just going to add into a series, but it's actually going to change the other series. Okay because you're kind of like measuring things in a more detailed way, right? So seeing how that changes the way you look at this is, is the exercise here by adding this additional factor, which is human capital, which which here in Penworld tables, it's not obvious, but you should look at the average years of schooling and just use that as a proxy for human capital, okay? Um, then part C is, is more like, look at, you know, give me a historical narrative of the country in the past century or so and tell me how to, you know, how does that link in? So like if you were looking at the US, you would see essentially, you know, straight line productivity and then like Great Depression, World War II, and then sort of like back to a straight line. So, yeah, so you would say, okay, look, well, there was a depression, there was a war where there's a huge ramp up in economic activity and we see that reflected. Okay, so you can do something like that for your particular country. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the first part. That's sort of like doing our traditional growth decomposition. Uh, the second part, is doing the Jones style beyond GDP welfare analysis. Okay, so here you're going to be taking that Jones Excel Excel sets spreadsheet from Jones and like kind of looking at these different factors. So you've got essentially the idea there is you're you've got GDP per capita kind of from the original data. Okay, and we know we can that's that's also in the Jones spreadsheet. And you have these additional sort of factors which modify welfare. Okay, so life expectancy. The consumption share, leisure, and inequality, all these things that we work through and how to incorporate those. Uh, you can see those in the spreadsheet, okay? So what I want you to do is take that and plot those, look at those over time, okay? Both in terms of levels for part A and then in terms of growth rates for part B. Um, it could be kind of cool if you link, if you could link them back to what we see in part A, which is like the constituent parts of uh, GDP per capita. Because, you know, these are really, these are, in some sense nested. The first part is like determining GDP per capita from different factors. The second part then is putting GDP cap per capita in welfare and adding in these additional factors, okay? But they might all be related and correlated. Okay, so maybe just talk about why that might be. So A is doing it in levels, B is looking at growth rates, okay? And this is stuff that 
is going to be, you know, based on, you can look at the, the slides for beyond GDP and see what we should be doing there. Okay. And then uh, part C is again, give me the, the historical context for all this and tell me is, is the specific things you can identify or trends you can identify that are lined up with historical events that seem to be related. Okay. Uh, and also tell me, you know, is this country similar to, to countries that are nearby geographically? Is it different? Is, and what are the, why is that? Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's number one. I mean, that's number two, actually, the welfare analysis with Jones. Uh, number three is more of a mini question. It's not as complete, not as like time intensive as the others, uh, which is basically looking into that inequality data from beyond GDP and sort of talk about what are the technological and political determinants of that. Okay. So maybe you know, postpone some of your inequality analysis to part three and talk about that more specifically. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, you know, but the final product should be basically a couple, you know, like four or more graphs in total, and then sort of like intersperse that with, uh, discussion context from historical sources. Uh, I mean, you don't have to do, you don't have to like necessarily cite your sources as you would in like a formal paper, just sort of like say, Hey, you could say where you got it, but you, you don't have to do like formal citations. Um, you can use Wikipedia too, if you want. I encourage using Wikipedia. So this isn't so much focusing on sort of that, like, um, sort of proper research, historical research, but more focused on sort of like getting these empirical facts from the data and then linking them with kind of broad trends that we see historically. Okay. Um, yeah. So then, yeah, that's the assignment. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I probably, you know, give it a shot. You kind of give it a brief perusal relatively soon, just so you kind of know what you need to do to prepare, make sure everything is in place. And then, then I kind of do it, you know, over time, but I give it like a, just a quick glance at some point in the near future. So you, just to make sure you're on board with everything. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's, that's it for now. Okay. In terms of the case study that's on the website and I'll create a, a formal blackboard uh, assignment you know module or whatever for for that okay um, alrighty so I guess we can go back to the lecture now uh, we've got a question here uh, would you want us to link our Excel sheets in our submission or would the graphs suffice I think um, the, it, as long as the graphs speak for themselves I think just the graphs so like you know, like if you if you had an Excel spreadsheet that you're basing it on and then you kind of export the graphs into like a doc or whatever and then put in the text there that's perfect you just give me the doc with the the graph the graphs and the plots and, and the text interspersed that's that's perfect you don't have to show me all the the underlying numbers um but but you know for the the one thing is for the plots yep for the plots uh you make sure they're kind of you know, want to think about you know like what's the best way to present this information should i be doing it more in, logs should be doing it relative to some countries okay think about the best way that really conveys that information don't make them too cluttered don't have a million lines on there try and label the lines and stuff like that label the axes and all that it's just make so just make it so that the, the plots can be interpreted by you know someone else that's sometimes there's a little bit of variability when you do these kinds of assignments some people kind of just like throw it anything out on a graph and hope for the best other people are like super careful I'd be, you know, go, err, err more towards the side of, of being careful uh, on the graphs. Okay. Um, okay. So then, uh, all right. So let's let's jump into, let's jump back into the Roman model. That's where we were last time. Okay. Uh, that's what I have up on the slides here. Although I'm going to switch to the whiteboard in a moment. Okay. So, but the basic idea, um, I'll go over the, the the essential constructs of the Roman model briefly, and then we can we can go back in. But the the process is going to be. You can see here we have this. Um, well, let me just let me just jump into the to the whiteboard. Okay, so we got whiteboard three. We got hotkeys. All right, so um, this is the Roma model of Paul Romer fame. Okay, uh, so that let me so that that production function. Let me just write that here. Looks like this. I'll explain it as we go on. Okay, so it's the I. Did I use I? I did. Okay, so um, basically taking labor here, 
raises some power and then taking a bunch of these these different x sides which are kind of like capital right because they got the alpha there like old capital but we're integrating over a bunch of them okay because now what's happening is we have let me see if i can draw semi straight lines here and it's like a wedge kind of thing it's like a pizza slice but it represents aggregation okay so we're taking a bunch of these different uh goods and we're aggregating them to one final output okay and then we're also sort of like l labors over here kind of jumping in and operating things okay so and then these are like the x this is like x1 x2 x3 etc okay so um and these are actually just capital okay they're you, you're taking all your capital and you're like distributing it amongst all these different firms they're doing their thing producing their machines somehow without labor uh and then we're ag some other firm kind of like a aggregating firm or a walmart or target taking all that together these gizmos and gadgets throwing in some labor some people that work there and then uh producing some final output okay so that's the pizza slice right there that produces things okay um at the end of the day you can see it's, it's capital and labor lead to output so in some sense it's similar to what we've been doing before but we're adding in this microstructure where you kind of split that amongst different firms then recombine it recombine the output of what they do okay so you can think about each of these is creating little gizmos that are you know useful to consumers okay so um and the reason we do that or the reason we add that microstructure is that we want to think about you know because there's actually a bunch of these firms there's zero over here and a over here and a is kind of expanding over time so the the, the set of different gizmos that we're making expands over time um and that's growth basically that's what's driving growth okay so this is an a and then it's being 100 percent perfect here okay so the, that a expanding the set of gizmos expanding is driving growth over time okay um and so the, the reason we add the microstructure is we want to think about what are the incentives for someone to go out sit in their garage and try and cook up a new idea uh and then potentially enter as a firm and make their the manifestation of their idea we want to think about their incentives to do that okay um and, and that's why we need to break it up into a bunch of different people okay doing different stuff okay so um right and so then uh yeah and so so basically um these xi's okay so this is like aggregation of the xi's now how do we produce these xi's exactly well uh we're gonna make make sure i get this right so so the produ producing cost of producing xi is going to be r times xi okay which is to say your marginal cost is just r okay um and with that essentially like you you can think about it as r is the interest rate okay and uh you are renting capital okay you're you're renting you're, you're like here's all this capital someone owns that doesn't really matter who you rent it from them to produce and then that makes a certain a certain amount of xi so you rent xi capital and that produces exactly xi in goods it's like a one for one production technology okay um right so then your cost is going to be r times xi and your, your marginal cost for any good i regardless of what i is is going to be r okay so just think you're like renting machines to produce today and you keep doing that every day or every year okay um okay and so that's that's how production works now um now we can start thinking about um pricing markets equilibria and, and all of that stuff okay because this is just a physical description okay uh, although we have some costs coming in here but it's basically a physical description now when i think about what would a market look like because we actually need to be specific about that so um okay and so this is kind of the road we started on last time okay and there's 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 two steps. The first step is to figure out that demand function. Okay. So essentially, you know, given some price, we want to figure out how much that aggregation firm is going to buy. Right. So these firms set a price PI, they, that induces some demand XI, and then they can figure out how much they're making, how much money they're making given that choice. Okay. So, uh, so we did this last time okay what you're going to get is you know price um oh okay so 
you, you can think about it like this. So they, uh, the, the profit, okay, of that final good firm, uh, let's, okay, so the profit of that aggregation firm is gonna be Y, whatever they produce at the end, minus however much they're spending on all these different inputs. So it's gonna be PI times XI. So like each XI, they buy XI, they pay it price PI, and then they integrate the over all of the stuff that they're buying, okay? And so um, if, if you take a derivative of this, with respect to xi, you're going to maximize over xi and set it to zero. So you'd say like zero is equal to del y del xi. Okay, sorry, that shouldn't be the marginal product for xi minus what's the derivative here? Well, you just get pi because it's only for one particular. Okay, so that's equal to zero, which means that marginal product is equal to price. Okay, so that's a standard result in uh, in any setting, really, in economics, is that marginal price is equal to marginal product. Okay, um, <clears throat> and we can, you know, if we know what y is. We can we can calculate that. Okay, so that means that you know, well, let's just invert it. So price is equal to marginal product, which is equal to what? Well, it's going to be just moving off of this. We're going to l to the one minus alpha, and then the derivative is just going to be alpha xi to the alpha minus one, okay? Which you can reduce to well, alpha times L over xi to the one minus alpha, just combining those terms, okay? So this is our, this is our inverse demand function, okay? Um, all right, and the, the, way, the way I'll write it is just like, I'm just gonna drop the i's and say like p of x is equal to alpha times L over X to the one minus alpha. Okay, so you, I'll watch out for my head there. Okay, so you're gonna get um, this inverse demand function saying, okay, if you wanna sell X, the price you're gonna be able to fetch is P, okay? Um, and that you know, obviously is the more you wanna sell, the less price you can charge because you know, decreasing marginal utility or whatever, okay? So, so that's that's our p of x, all right? Okay, so that that's saying given how much the this aggregation firm is demanding, what's our what's our inverse demand function? Okay, or like given the aggregation firm's production function is what's our inverse demand function? Okay. Um, now we want to think about the intermediate firms. Okay, so remember there's two actors in this setting. Okay, there's uh, the aggregation firm, which takes the XIs and turns it into to final good. Then there's these individual firms, which take XI, which, which produce the XIs themselves. Okay, so these little individual firms here, we're gonna think about them, okay? They're facing this, this inverse demand function, P of X. We're gonna think about what their problem is, okay? So this was like the aggregate firm. I'll call this the aggregating firm, okay? And this is gonna be Intermediate firms. Intermediate firms. Okay, that are going on here. These are two different, two different problems that we're going to be solving. Okay, so now the intermediate firms. Think about their profit. Okay. As a function of like how much they're going to produce x. Okay, so that's going to be. The price that they can get times the quantity. This is their revenues, p of x times x, and then how much they have to pay. Remember, they, their marginal cost is r, so their total cost is r x. Okay, or if you'd like, you can factor out x and get p of x minus r, which is their sort of their unit margin, times the quantity x. Okay, so that's their that's their profit. Okay, and this is kind of almost where we where we pick where we sort of ended last time. We were deriving, what is this firm gonna do? Okay, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna choose X given this inverse demand function? Okay, so um, to do that, we do the same thing we always do, which is take a derivative and set it equal to zero. That's how you maximize stuff. Okay, so we're gonna say that zero is equal to del pi or d pi dx. Okay, and then derive everything from there. That's, that'll give us our maximum. Okay, so then uh, 
let's just use this form here. So first, the first term times the derivative of the second, which is actually just one the derivative of x with respect to x is one. Okay, plus uh, the derivative of the first p prime of x, the derivative of that inverse band function times second x. Okay, so this is saying uh, you sell if you if you if you increase x, you get that additional margin, which is coming from here that price margin, uh, but from one unit, and then you also push down the price a little bit. So for any for all of your units x, you get a little bit less per unit. Okay, so that's that's the trade off for pricing. Okay. Um, all right, so then let's let's go vertical here. All right, so now we want to figure out what does this mean. Okay, so first you can say, okay, well, just turn this into like a something equals something else equation. So subtract off that p prime of x. Okay, so this is saying that price margin should be equal to what you're losing per unit. Okay, so it's like there's two forces, and we're saying these should be equal. Remember that p prime is neg negative. That that inverse demand function slopes downward. The more you sell, the less price you get per unit. So this minus p prime is actually a positive number. So this is a positive number, this is a positive number. So they can be equal to each other, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then what we're gonna do, next step, is divide by p of x. So we get p of x minus r over p of x. This is like your price margin divided by the actual price, okay? Uh, that's gonna be minus p prime of x times x over p of x, okay? All right, so this is like, this is where we need to get clever. Not too clever, just moderately clever, all right? So um, it turns out that this thing here, though it looks complicated, is actually, for us, pretty simple, okay? Because remember, this is our, this is our p of x, all right? Okay, so this is, this is the derivative divided by the value. So this is actually like the growth rate, okay? And then kind of amped up by a factor of the quantity x, okay? So this is like, for any function like f of x, you can define this kind of thing, which is like the elasticity. This says, um, given a certain percentage change in x, how by how many percent does uh, p change, okay? So, um, let's see. Yep. Yeah, so, so essentially, because you're normalizing by p, okay, and you're sort of also implicitly normalizing by x. So, this is saying, you know, if you calculate this number, and let's say it was two, it would you know, mean if you change x, the quantity, by 10%, the price goes down by 20%, okay? And if you change the, you know, change the quantity by 20%, the price goes down by 40%. Okay, so this elasticity relates percentages rather than a derivative, which relates values. The elasticity relates percentages, and that's the beauty of the elasticity, okay? Um, it turns out that you can calculate that elasticity for this. So this is something you can calculate for any function, right? So if, if I calculated it for uh, the function f of x equals x, okay, so maybe I'll do that here. It's instructive, I think. What if f of x equals x, and I calculated um, f prime of x times x over f of x? Well, I'd get 1 times x over x, which is equal to 1. So it turns out that a linear function has what's called unit or 1 value 1 elasticity. So if you change x by 10%, obviously f of x changes by 10%. Okay. Um, these are going to start looking like the rules of growth rates, actually. They're, they're analogous, okay, because um, turns out this is like, it's actually also like a derivative in the log space. Okay, I won't get into that too much, but yeah. So if, so if the other thing you do is like f of x equals a times x. What is what is this? Then sometimes people call this the, the elastic epsilon of f, the elasticity of f, okay? So what, what if we do the elasticity here? Well, then f prime is a times x over f of x, which is ax. Again, we get one. The cool thing about elasticities is they don't care about constants. Constants, they're not, they're not, they're not concerned with those, okay? They, it's still true that if you change x by 10%, then f of x changes by 10%, okay, because it's proportional. Um, but then if you start doing stuff like x uh, raises some power alpha, let's say, okay, then what do you get? Well, then you're going to get what? f prime of x is going to be alpha 
x to the alpha minus 1. Again, we get times x, and then we get x to the alpha, that's f of x. Okay, so you can see like with the derivative, you kind of kick down this exponent, but then you add it back. So that it look, this, this whole thing here will be x to the alpha, which is going to perfectly cancel, so you get alpha. Okay, so then here again, you, if, you, if you have this exponent, you just pick up the exponent. If you change x by 10%, and let's say alpha is a half, then you're going to change f of x by 5%. Okay, so that square root's going to like dampen things, you know? So, um, so it's cool. I mean, it's like a derivative, but you just pick up exponents. It's like a pro proportional derivative, okay? Um, and it can be useful. And it, it makes things, it makes our lives easier once we understand it, okay? Um, all right, so then now we can piece together what's going to happen. So this p of x, you know, this is alpha, l to the 1 minus alpha, x to the alpha minus 1, right? So uh, this stuff, these are just constants. These don't depend on x. Those are like a, and then this exponent, this is going to get picked up. Okay, it's going to get picked up by that elasticity. So if f of x, you know, or like, you know, given, given what we know here, like the elasticity of p is going to be, you know, p prime of x times x over p of x. And so what we're going to get is just alpha minus 1. Okay, the same, for the same reason here, we're going to take a derivative. The constants don't matter, and we're just going to pick up this this exponent here, okay, just like with growth rates. Okay, and so then, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so to clarify, would the elasticity we're finding with price function be the elasticity of demand? Um, yeah. So it's actually te technically it's the elasticity of inverse demand. Um, but the other cool thing about this is that. Uh, if we if we get the elasticity of uh, inverse demand, then um, the elasticity of demand is just one over whatever we found. So in this case, the elasticity of demand, because the elasticity of inverse demand is alpha minus one, the elasticity of demand would be one over alpha minus one, or, or like minus one over one minus alpha. Okay, so the, the demand elasticity should be negative. So um, so uh, yeah, so you get you you can actually just get it with a one over one minus alpha. Another way to think about that is if you start here and uh, you flip it around into a demand function, right? You're gonna get, um, what, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna skip like five different steps here, but you're gonna get something like uh, alpha over P here to the one over one minus alpha. Okay, so you can like move the X over, move P over, kill off some exponents. You're, if, you, in, if you flip this around, you're gonna get X of P and it's gonna, because you flipped it around, you're going to get p raised to like one over one minus alpha, which is exactly what we see here. So, but but in general, like the if a function has a certain elasticity, its inverse is just one over that elasticity. Another cool property of, of elasticities uh, that's that's like generally true, but also useful like in our in our econ context as well. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, and, but you can you know for any of this stuff, you can always calculate it directly. And you'll see that you're going to get that one over one minus alpha, okay? Um, and then, yeah, I mean, but then in terms of the, uh, yeah, I mean, and you can see like you know, the, this is going to affect elasticity because you know, anytime you're raising this exponent to some power, I mean, if the higher this exponent is, the more it's going to jump around when you change it a little bit, okay? Uh, and so it, it's sort of just like, yeah, it, it it exactly sort of lines up with how we might think about elasticity intuitively. Okay, um, and now yeah, the only difference is like if you, you know, when you when you guys we draw like demand supply and demand graphs in in like just stylized like linear case like those you know like these these are really like curves like they're they're actually curved they're like nonlinear but um, in the log space they're linear so maybe that's a way to think about it. Okay, so um, so then what do we get? If we if we take so so if we take this right, we found that this term here should be alpha minus one. We plug that in here, so it's just minus alpha minus one. So this, this is minus one minus alpha. So then if we negate that, we just get one minus alpha. It's a simple uh, function there. Okay, so uh, okay, um, make sure that this is. All consistent, I feel like. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, 
thought I made a mistake momentarily. So, uh, so we're going to get one minus alpha here. All right. So that at the end of the day, this is saying, I'm going to actually drop the X, just write P minus R over P is equal to one minus alpha. That's what we can conclude. Okay. And that's kind of cool because, you know, in general, like you have X's and P's floating around and it's, and it's not clear how to solve the equation, but here we just have price. Okay. We, we, just, we can just solve this for what the price should be. Okay. So, um, so let's do that. So first you can see if you divide the P3, you're going to get one minus R over P is equal to one minus alpha. Okay. And if you just kill off those ones and you're going to get, you know, R over P is equal to alpha. Okay. And then, uh, solving for P, well, I just flip the P and the alpha, you're going to get P is equal to R over alpha. Okay. So this is kind of our main result here. Okay. P is equal to R over alpha. Okay. So let's, let's inspect that a little bit and see what it means. Um, so, so, you know, and another way to say this, which is, which is in normalized terms, P over R, what is P over R? That's price over marginal cost. That's your markup over marginal cost. If you're in a competitive setting, this should be equal to one. Okay. So P over R is equal to one over alpha. Okay. So, um, that's, 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 I think the most succinct way to say that your markup over cost is one over alpha. Okay. And remember alpha, where it originally shows up, sort of its core meaning is, is well, it has two meanings. It controls the labor share and the capital share, but it also controls how easily, easy you can substitute between these goods. Okay. So if alpha was one, okay, the X's are like perfect substitutes because, because if alpha is one, you're just adding them all together and you can increase one and decrease the other by the same amount. And this, you have the same outcome. So um, when alpha equals one, they're perfect substitutes. You can see when alpha equals one here, price equals marginal cost. Um, so that that makes sense because if they're perfect substitutes and I increase my price a little bit, everyone's going to bail on me and go consume the, the other goods, which are perfectly substitutable. Okay, and I have no market power. If you go to the other direction where alpha is zero, they're not substitutable nearly at all. I have a lot of market power. You essentially have to buy my good to survive. Uh, and so, um, or it's like really valuable to buy my good. Um, so I can charge a lot. Okay. So it controls the level of monopoly power that uh, these firms have. And it also, and hence it controls the prices that they're going to charge. Okay. Um, and, and so alpha, but it, alpha is a technological parameter. Okay. It's a, it's just a property of goods and utility and production. Okay. Um, all right. So this is important. Okay. And from here we can pretty quickly get to levels of profit. Okay. So, so that was, this is like solving for the price. And now we want to think about, um, profit. Okay. So let's do that. Okay. So what is profit? Uh, remember profit was pi is uh, uh, P X minus R X, which is P minus R times X. All right. So here we're going to try and be a little bit clever. Okay. Because, um, Why is that? Uh, we're going to be a little bit clever because we, we kind of know, we know a couple things. So we know P, that's good. All right. And uh, so we know that P is equal to R over alpha. Okay. We also know, um, well, we, we, we can figure out what X is. Okay. So remember X was, if you go back to that, that demand function, okay, that turned out to be useful. X is L times alpha over P to one over minus alpha. Okay, so this this comes from inverting that inverse demand function. You can get the demand function itself. Okay, all right. Um, okay, and so that's uh, uh, so in this case, right? If you plug in P 
okay? You're gonna get L times, you're actually gonna, if you, if you plug in P here, you're gonna get alpha times alpha over R, so you're gonna get alpha squared over R. Okay, there's one over one minus alpha. Okay, so okay, alphas don't cancel. Maybe you thought they would cancel in the, in the beginning, but they don't cancel, right? So you get something a little bit, a little messy. Um, it's not the worst thing, okay? Um, okay, so now if we plug this in here for P, okay, we're gonna get R over alpha minus R times X. Okay, let's keep X as is for now. Um, the other thing we know uh, on top of this is Remember what X is, right? So X is, um, how should I say this? That capital, remember, it gets split up into all the X's. Okay, so in, in fact, when you add up all the X's over all these different product lines, you're gonna, you should get capital, okay? That's like a market clearing condition. So here, we just found something interesting though. We found that the price um, is, is R for alpha. Remember, and you can see here that the price doesn't depend on on i. I, I dropped this, the i type code, but there's nothing specific to any particular good, okay? Uh, because all the goods kind of look the same, right? So then this price is the same for all goods, okay? And hence the quantity is the same for all goods, okay? So that means that if you think about capital, if you add up capital, so there's a different goods. Remember that. So jump up here. That integral is from zero to a. There's a different goods here, zero to a at any given time, okay? So you, capital should be total number of goods times the number you're using for each good, which is X across all of them, okay? So so we should have K equals AX, or in other words, X equals K over A. So all this is saying is that you have a certain amount of capital that you're using for those goods. They're each using the same amount, so it should, it should just be the total divided by the number of goods. So X should be equal to K over A, okay? That, that's what we're gonna use here. So, um, K over A, all right? Um, and then the other, the other thing we can do here is, uh, uh, let's see, we can um, factor out this R. So th this actually would be like R times alpha minus alpha over alpha times K over A, okay? So that's really our, our profit expression there, okay? Um, Okay, so that's that's good. Okay, so so that we're gonna have a lot of moving parts here. Okay, so so this is where things get a little bit wild, but then they kind of converge at the end and, and aren't too crazy. Okay, but but um, I guess we should. At the end of the day, the useful thing that we just found was was basically what profits look like. Okay, and we're gonna keep that for for later. Okay. Um, Okay, so now the other thing we can do is uh, use that, remember that inverse demand function, okay? That said that P is equal to alpha times, what was it again? L over X to the one minus alpha. That's that old P of X, that inverse demand function that we had from before, okay? Uh, we can, we can use this too, okay? Um, given that we know P and we know X is, is now K over A, we can use this, all right? So what does this mean? So P is, remember we found was R over alpha, so alpha, okay? And then this is L, and then X we're saying is K over A. So it's K divided by A here to the one minus alpha. Okay, so this doesn't look super useful, but actually let's keep rearranging it and see what happens. So this A, this over A should, we can, that, that's actually on top. So that's like AL over K to the one minus alpha, okay? So that's, that's starting to look like something that we've seen before, okay? Um, 
in fact, you know, we, we often, like when we were doing solo stuff, we would see that Y, you know, that, that K over AL was related to Y over AL in particular. Okay, so we're gonna see that. Um, okay, so but at the end of the day we get, oop, we get that P, sorry, the R over alpha equal to alpha. Okay, it's still a nice alpha, All right? So um, let's keep that here. We're gonna remove that too. Okay, so that's gonna be another useful equation. Okay. Now, um, what we wanna do, okay, is we wanna relate this back to output. Okay, so remember, I'm gonna jump up again here real quick. Remember output here. Y was equal to L, the one minus alpha, and it's times this integral. So one of the things, one of the most important things that we've found so far because of that pricing stuff is that all the X's, they're actually the same and they're equal to K over A, okay? So that makes this integral much simpler, okay? So if we say, okay, what is Y again? Y is L to the one minus alpha, integral from zero to A, Y to the alpha, di that's that's our definition of y okay and given that we know all of the uh x size are the same that's here this integral here is going to be a times all those x size to the alpha which is like k over a to the alpha okay um and what if we simplify this then we're going to get well, we're going to get k to the alpha we're gonna get L to the one minus alpha. We're gonna get A to the one, and then minus alpha. So we're gonna get A to the one minus alpha, okay? And then if you combine that, you get K to the alpha, AL to the one minus alpha, okay? Which is, then this is equal to Y, okay? So what we find actually is, since we found all the X's were the same, okay, then that, that A actually ends up just looking like our old friend labor augmenting technological change. Okay, so so the idea is that we started with this new microstructure, but then, and it's useful because we can think about the incentives later on, but we also see that if you reduce it back, if you relate it back to the macro level, it actually looks exactly the same. Okay, so that's cool because it's sort of like, you know, it fits back in with the models that we've been using from before. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's, that's cool. And if we if we think about from that equation, if we think about y over al, we think what is y over al? Well, it's going to be k to the alpha al to the minus alpha, which is k over al to the alpha. Okay. Um, okay, and so then let me. Where are my notes here? One second. Um, that's right. Okay. So then, um, let me just make sure I know how to proceed here. Okay, so that's that's one equation that we can we can use. Okay, although that's not that's not exactly the one that I should have been using. Um, the other thing we can calculate is y over k. Okay, so if we think about y over k, then that's going to be k to the alpha minus one times al to the one minus alpha, which is al over k to the one minus alpha. So you take this equation and just divide by k. It's like the average k product, um, and you're going to get al over k to the one minus alpha. Okay, and so that's useful. Okay, because that's exactly what we have here. All right, so we kind of use that aggregate um, production function. Okay, and then we conclude that r over alpha 
is equal to what? It's equal to alpha here. And then this thing is now is equal to y over k. Okay, so that's y over k. Um, all right, so that, that was a lot of work, okay? But we're gonna get a, some reward here, okay? Which is that, okay, so we have this relatively simple expression here, okay? And another way to write this, if we rearrange things, is that r times k over y is equal to alpha squared, okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that you have a certain amount of capital K. The interest, the, the interest rate here is like a rental rate on capital. So this is like the price of capital. So then like RK is the total amount of capital gains. The, pe the people that are like running out the capital, this is their capital gains, RK. Um, and then divided by total output is equal to alpha squared. So this is saying, you, know, you always have to, at the end of the day, one really important thing is where is all the money going? Okay, all, there's like a certain amount of income Y in the economy and it's going to different people. Like before we saw that you'd have this labor share where one minus alpha would go to, um, uh, one minus alpha fraction, okay, would go to labor and an alpha fraction would go to capital. Now here, let's keep in mind what we have. We have, we do have labor, okay? We do have capital. We have people renting out capital of the intermediate firms. But we also have profit, okay? That's another thing that we didn't so much see before, but we're gonna have uh, profit, okay? As a um, an income destination, okay? Because if the firms are making profits, right? They're like monopolists, they're making profits, and so that's another destination for income. So you have profit, capital, labor. Those are the three primary um, places where the stuff's going. Okay, so um, now you want to be you want to be careful here, okay? Because you know, usually when people say capital income, they like in a in a in the in the world out in the real world, they mean uh, they they like they kind of mean like stocks and, and capital combined. Okay, so sometimes people like when they say capital income, they just mean these two combined. In this model, they're separate. So it's like you have like profits from firms. Then you have like capital from people that have capital equipment that are renting it out. Okay, so then those are separated in principle. Okay, um, the reason that they're combined in the real world is because oftentimes the capital is also owned by firms, and so the firms would represent kind of both of these at the same time. So it's it's a reasonable thing to do in some sense, but it's 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 an important distinction to make. Okay, um, so what this is saying, at least we know part of the puzzle now, is that this thing here, this part that's an alpha squared fraction. Okay, so if alpha was a half, for instance, then it would be 25% a quarter, 25% would go to capital, okay? Um, and we, so we've, we were able to derive that from, you know, by figuring out what's sort of like the market equilibrium and then finding out like what these prices should look like, okay? So that's one, we can find the other ones actually. Uh, the next easiest to find is gonna be uh, capital. Sorry, um, profit, okay? Uh, the next easiest one to find is gonna be profit, okay? So, um, and, and actually, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. So we can use this this equation that we'd, we'd previously started, okay? Uh, so let's let's take that equation and, and move it down, down farther to the bottom of the page, okay? So it's saying that pi is equal to one minus alpha over alpha times rk over a. So this RK, we kind of we kind of figured out what that is. That's like kind of like alpha squared. Okay, so then that's going to help us out quite a bit. Okay, so let me rewrite that equation down here. So pi is equal to one minus alpha over alpha times RK over A. Okay. Now, what what we can do is we'll keep this one minus alpha over alpha. Okay. Now we know RK is basically, if we remove this over, RK is alpha squared times Y. Okay, so this is alpha squared times Y on the top over A. Okay, which is, uh, you know, this, these two are gonna cancel and just turn into alpha. So it's alpha, one minus alpha times Y over A. Okay, so that's almost what we want. We have pi profits are equal to some, constants alpha times one minus alpha fraction of y, but then there's the a, what's the a doing? 
Well, it turns out the A, we want the A to be there because we can move the A over and say A pi. So what is A pi? Remember, pi is pi is the profit for one firm, but there are actually A of these firms out there. Okay, so the total profit is, is actually A pi. So it's good that we have the A. Uh, and that's going to be equal to alpha times 1 minus alpha times Y. Okay, and that's this here. So this is alpha times 1 minus alpha. Okay. So it's not as simple as before where you just have alpha and 1 minus alpha because now we have three different sources. Okay. But if you take that Q from the real world and say, well, well what if we combine capital and profits into sort of like our notion of, you know, firm, total firm activity? Uh, well, what, what is that? That's alpha squared plus alpha times 1 minus alpha. Well, th this is just alpha minus alpha squared. So at the end of the day, this whole sum here is just alpha. Okay. So in fact, you know, this, this thing here looks like ca like capital of old, where it's just the total share is alpha. And you can kind of guess then if, well, this, this side is alpha, then this is going to, this has to be one minus alpha. And in fact, that is, that is going to be the case. Okay. So, um, it's, got al it's still the case that one minus alpha is the labor share. And then alpha goes to, to, to sort of firm capital side. It's just that you split it between capital and profits. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's sort of the most important takeaway is just, just figuring out these like these ratios. Okay, so we get like, oops, profit ratio, a pi over y, I'm just moving it over, is equal to alpha times one minus alpha. Okay, so these, these ratios are very important, okay? They're gonna help us uh, later on, okay? Um, yeah, and then you can derive, if you find WL over y, that last component, we will be able, we can we can drive it later. We can see that that's going to be one minus alpha. Okay, so at the end of the day, all these things add up. That's important. Okay. Um. All right. So that was. Fortunately, there's no like easy way to derive that stuff. You just have to kind of slog through it. Okay. But at the end of the day, you can get these sort of like top line numbers and figure out where the income's going. Okay. Because. Essentially, like all the assumptions that you make about how do markets work, are they competitive, are people monopolists, that determines these outcomes. If, you know, so like the more, kind of in some sense, the more monopolistic uh, the firms are, the higher the profits are going to be, okay, um, and capital as well, and and so that's going to sort of mediate these things, okay. Um, all right, so now, now we can kind of go. That was like phase one, okay, and now we can we can go on like phase two. So so but this what this gave us though is it gave us the following. If we go back to our market diagram here, a production diagram. So essentially, it's saying okay, we have this production system wherein we take capital, split it a bunch of a bunch of a bunch of monopolistic firms, they make stuff and sell it to an aggregator and produce output. Okay, with labor. Um, now we've figured out like, you know, what's going, how, what fraction of that output goes to capital? What fraction of that output goes to labor? What fraction of that output goes to the, these profits accruing to these individual firms? Okay, we figure out who gets what for this whole big production system that has essentially like three different actors that are necessary parts of it. Okay, and we and and if you think about well, where does technology and all of this? Well, technology here is A. Technology is sort of like the sum total of different ideas that people about, about the different ideas about products that people have had. And that's A, the total number of products, okay? So A, a is a state variable of technology, is the state of technology. Um, and, and, so, and that features in these decompositions and we can see that that's gonna be important, okay? So what we're gonna do now is given we've solved what's called like the static production system, we figured out given tech, the state of technology today, how much is produced and who gets what from that product production, okay, in terms of um, income, okay? So the next thing we're gonna, the, and really the final thing we're gonna do is figure out, well, what are the incentives to increase A? Because that's the whole reason we did this in the first place. We wanna make a big dynamic model that allows for people to actually choose how much to invest in research, okay? Rather than just assuming that research happens magically and 
and the, and, and Elias and so on. Okay, so the way we do that is we say, okay, well, we kind of know we know that like these these folks here are making pie profits. Okay, like every year, right? Every year they make pie profits without fail, basically. Okay, because they're monopolists. Now, um, firms when they make research and R R and D decisions, or really anyone when they make these kinds of decisions. Uh, they don't just think about what they're making today. They, they think about the, the net present value of what they're making. So we're going to call that V. So they're going to convert that into something like a net present value. They're going to use the interest rate to do that because that determines like how they discount the future. Okay. So they're going to convert profits into like a net present value. This would be more like if this is like your, your profit, like financial profits, EBITDA or whatever, um, this would be like your stock price, right? V would be like a stock price. Okay. And that, that'll be important. So, so think about V as a stock price. Now, the, the total value of the firm. Actually, sorry. V, you should think about, if, if you want to be real proper about finance here, you should think about V as the market capitalization. Okay? Or you could think about it as the stock price if there was literally only one share. You know, so market cap is really the best way to interpret this. Okay? So then, that's how... The, so when they're making a research decision, the the what happens is they they do some research, sit around and fiddle around with stuff. Um, and if they're successful, they create a new product, they add another A to the end here. And they start producing that. They get pi every year. And in terms of present value, they just get like V today. Okay. So they're trading off using their time to do research as a cost, and then the benefit is. Uh, getting potentially um, a new idea that you can turn into a firm and make V dollars in net, net present value terms, okay? Um, that's one thing they could do. The alternative, uh, yeah, so the alternative option for them would be to be a production worker, to be, to, to be L, okay? So like you could either be R and try and go after that return or a researcher, or you could be a production laborer. And we're going to say, like, you, you can just choose either one, so you should be kind of, there's going to be, like, a common wage there. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Okay, so then let's let's try and work through that. Okay, so this is going to be, like, the search. This is, like, the really, this is the, the new part. This is the, given that we all did all this, you know, drudgery, algebra work to get this stuff, we want to be able to use that to actually figure out what kind of research decisions people are gonna make, okay? Um, okay, so uh, so the idea is you're gonna have what's called like a free entry condition. Okay, I'll explain that what, is, what that is. So the idea is, is this choice. You can choose between being a production worker in which case you just get like for sure a wage W. Okay. Uh, so that's production, production worker, or you can do research first research. So it's um, research is risky, but actually we're going to kind of assume away any of these risk. We're going to assume people are kind of risk neutral. So the idea here is if, if you do research, okay. Um, What's your return? So, like, we're going to assume some probability that you succeed. Jones called it theta bar for reasons I'm not entirely sure on, but I'm going to stick with what he writes and call that theta bar. Uh, that's the probability that you succeed, okay? And then uh, V is the benefit that you accrue if you succeed. So, the, I mean, the, the expected benefit is the probability that you, you come up with an idea times that value of getting the idea, which we'll call V. So this is, like, the expected benefit of doing research, Okay. And this is the expected benefit of doing being a production worker. It's risk neutral. You just you go to work, you get wage W. Okay, um, no unemployment or anything like that. But yeah. Um, so what what should be the relationship between these two? Okay. So given that I said that we should be able to choose freely between these two, it should be the case that in fact that they're equal, right? Because if one of them was greater than the other, then kind of everyone would just do one thing and not do the other, 
we want to have people bo doing both production and research. You got to have both to keep the economy going. All right. So to, to, to do that, you need to be exactly at this point where these two are equal. Okay. In general, of course, it takes education to be able to do research most of the time. Uh, so if, if you made a richer model where you had to pay for it costly education to do research, you'd say that this should be higher to compensate for that cost. But here we're saying you can just, you know, you can say you're on the factory and then boom, you're going to like, actually, I'm going to do research now, um, which happens sometimes. I mean, not, not all research is like, you got to have a PhD or something to do it. I mean, you know, like Apple, I think Steve Wozniak and all that, they were, they had, you know, probably bachelor's or something, maybe master's uh, degrees and they just kind of fooling around in their graduate stuff. So, um, so maybe this isn't the worst assumption, okay? Um, so the idea is you should have equality between these two options to make sure that both actually happen, okay? Um, okay, and that's, that's actually um, gonna get us most of the way, okay? There's just one little thing that we have to worry about, which is uh, what is value? How do we calculate the value, okay? Um, so that's moderately tricky. Okay. Uh, but here's, here's, here's the, the logic. Okay. So if, if, yeah, I mean, in, in finance, they, 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 they do stuff like this in finance, but you're calculating the value of a bond or the bond coupon or whatever, kind of like analogous, but, but, but it's slightly different. So I need to give it full treatment here. Um, what is the value? What is V? It should have something to do with pi, right? It's kind of like an integration of pi. So think about it like this. Um, again, this, this relies on creating a difference between two choices to determine a value, okay? So what are the two choices? You, you, you often have two choices in, in the, the financial world. One, let's, let's say you have V dollars, V dollars. Okay, so it's enough to buy the whole company. You just happen to have that exact amount of money. Okay. Um, we can we could buy a bond with that money. We could buy bonds instead of the company. And if we bought bonds, we'd get return R times V dollars, right? So the company's worth a million bucks, interest rate is 5%, then uh, 100, wait, what is that? The interest rate is five. That's fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so if you had a million dollars and the interest rate five percent, you could make fifty thousand dollars a year. That's pretty good, by the way. Um, just for putting it in a bond. Now, nowadays we're not going to get five percent return, but maybe someday we will. Okay, so that's the bond. Okay, I'm not. These are going to be equal, but I'm not going to write that because I'm going to keep you in suspense. Okay, bond versus this isn't like a bond movie. This is like a you know it's not James Bond. This is a you know a, a financial bond. Uh, versus stock, okay? That's like the big choice. Do you buy stocks or do you buy bonds? If you buy the stock, well, this is where the real world and the theoretical world diverge a little bit, but in principle, stocks can give dividends. Some do, most don't, um, but they can give dividends. So if you imagine that the what the stock, what the company did was just say, okay, um, we're gonna, any profits we make, we're gonna give out as dividends, okay? So you're gonna get pi, per year. Okay, so so this is like you had that V dollars. Um one option is is invest in bonds get RV. The other option is like to buy the company. So it's like buy all the stock. Not just some stock, buy the whole company. Okay. So um so you get the profits pi, okay? But also it's it's the case that stock prices change. Okay. So you're gonna get plus like the change in the stock price, which we're gonna call just the derivative over like one year, that's those are roughly the same. So we're gonna that's gonna be V dot, okay? So this is like investing in bonds versus buying all of the stock in the company, which is to say buy the company, all right? Um, and again, because we want people to kind of do both of these, these should be equal. So this is indifference. If you've heard the term no arbitrage, same thing. There's no way you can like buy all sorts of different stuff and make free money. That's what this is saying, okay? because uh, we don't want that. Um, okay, so then this this is like our, our equation relating pi and v, okay? Um, or if you want to write it, like sometimes people write it like to subtract the v dot equals pi. doesn't really matter, okay? So uh, 
we don't need to do that. So, so what does this mean? Um, well, not, not so much what does it mean, but what can we do with it? Um, sorry, I'm really doing a really bad job at erasing stuff here. Okay, so what can we do with this equation? Um, in general, it's a little bit tricky to work with, but one, one thing you can do is just divide by V. So you get R equals pi over V plus V dot over V, okay? Um, okay, so that is maybe still doesn't look that helpful. We can, we can maybe say, okay, let's do this pi over V. Let's call that GV. Why not? Okay. Um, this seems kind of like a shell game, but then what you can do from here is actually solve for V. So V would be like pi divided by R minus GV. So if you solve for V in this equation, you're going to get pi over R minus GV. Okay, so that, that really seemed like I was cheating there, right? But I, it actually works, okay? So what, what this is saying is that V is like equal to pi divided by something like an interest rate with this little modifier. Okay, and that's a pretty common result that to get from a, a, a flow value pi to a net present value v, you just divide by your discount rate. In this case, it turns out our discount rate is r minus gv. Okay. The other thing that means is that um, v and pi should have the same growth rate, right? So v should have the same growth rate as pi. Okay. Um, and since I'm running out of time. I'm just gonna assert that the growth rate of pi is actually equal to the growth rate of, of, of the population. Okay, we can go into that later, but it's, it's gonna be true, okay? So at the end of the day, V is pi divided by a thing, R, R minus on a discount rate of some sort, okay? Um, and that's what we needed to know, all right? So, uh, and then finally, we can plug that in here, right? We can say that W, should be equal to theta bar times pi over r minus n. Okay. So now we're we're kind of nearing the point where we actually know what's going on. Okay. Because we have this equation which is going to tell us what what is this going to tell us? I mean, what is left to know? The main thing that's left to know is um how many people are doing production? Is it production versus research? So there's a certain amount of people out there. Some are producers, some are researchers. That we don't know. That's going to be determined by this, because essentially, um, this is this. Yeah, once we plug in everything, this is going to be an equation that's going to tell us how many people are doing production and how many people are doing research, okay? So what we need to do is plug in what we know about uh, W and pi, okay? So we're, we're like really short on time here, but I'll give you like the first step and then I'll leave you in suspense as to what the outcome is gonna be. Um, so we plug in for W, you can use this, right? So W is gonna be, if you, if you arrange that, one minus alpha times y over l, okay? And then pi, you can do the same thing. Pi is gonna be alpha times one minus alpha times y over a. Okay? And so, um, all right, and so then from here, we can cancel the one minus alphas, we can cancel the y's even. So we're gonna get one over L equal to theta bar times alpha times one over A. Okay, so that's um, that's pretty simple, okay? Um, now, this is, yeah, I don't know, we're, we're kind of low on time and there's a few more steps that I have to execute here. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I got it. I think I should stop it here. Okay. So we're going to be able to get to, at the end of the day, we're going to get to what? We're going to get to something like uh, R over L. What's the fraction of uh, the total population that's doing research? Okay. So like in the U.S., 
that's like 0.5 percent it's pretty small actually um in terms of people total fraction of people that are doing research like 0.5 percent we're going to be able to solve for our I'll, I'll show you next time okay but we're out of time today um and that's that's like our main variable of interest okay so um all right so i think that's that's it for now today um you know just remember you got that homework out that's up on the website um i checked that out give it a quick <clears throat> look through soon and then start working on it you know when you get the chance when you get a chance uh, okay now i'm like losing my voice uh working on it when you get the chance okay i've actually like officially lost my voice so <clears throat> see ya